Welcome to Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene in Caldwell, Idaho. This is the Sunday morning service. Sounds good. Looks good. Looks good. Well, so it is so exciting to be here. Hi, it's good to see you again. Uh, see some friends that, that I've met from, from a while back. And yeah, as Pastor says, um, my name is Brian. I'm the CEO of Extreme Missions. And uh, when I walk in the building here, it's just like, hi, I'm Brian. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Brian. Hi, I'm Brian. Uh, everybody here is named Brian, so it makes it easy for me. Um, but I, I want to share with you a little bit about what, uh, what it is exactly that we, that we do. And, and I want to do that through a story. Can we, can we do that? Can we start off with a story? Raise your hand if you like to hear a story. All right. So it's the bottom of the ninth. The bases are loaded. We're down by two, and there's two outs. Anybody here when they were a little kid have that kind of daydream, that kind of uh, fantasy where, where it's up to us and, and if we don't pull out in the clutch, we're going to let our team down, but if we do, we bring it all in. Well, this is real life. It's the semifinals before the World Series in Venezuela. And there's a young man, Yuan Kamikado, who's, who's coming up and it's the bottom of the ninth. The bases are loaded. We're down by two. There's two outs. And this kid has never been more nervous in his, in his life. He's 17 years old, and he gets up to the plate, and here comes the first pitch, and he swings, strike, strike one. Here comes the next pitch, it's a ball, and, and his nerves just keep going up and up, and he's getting more and more nervous. The next pitch comes, it's another ball. He just gets more nervous, and the next pitch comes, it's another ball. Oh, man, bottom of the ninth, the bases are loaded. We're down by two. We got two outs, we got three balls and one strike. Anybody know what you have to do in that scenario? Anybody know? You have to swing. That's right. You have to swing. And the pitcher knows that. And Yuan knows that. And here comes the pitch. And he swings with everything he's got. He connects. And the ball goes up, up, up. And it fouls out on the right side. So now we're, it's at the bottom of the ninth. We're down by two. Bases are loaded. Full count. It couldn't get higher pressure than this, ladies and gentlemen. Semifinals before the, the World Series of Venezuela baseball. So Yuan, he's 17, he, he steps out of the batter's box, he's as nervous as could possibly be, and he knocks the dirt off his cleats. I don't know what that does, I think it helps him concentrate. So anyway, he knocks the dirt off his cleats, and he says a prayer. Now that might sound natural, but he's only been to church twice in his life, once for a funeral and once for a wedding. And he says a prayer, and he, and he goes like this, he says, God, if you help me out, I don't know if anybody here has ever had a prayer like that, <laughs> God, if you help me out, I'll start going to church. He thought that that's what God wanted from him. And so in order to get this favor, he had to do something. And God, okay. So he gets back into the, into the batter's box, up to the plate. And he is as nervous as is possible. And here comes the pitch. And almost closing his eyes, he swings. He connects with the ball. He goes up, up, up. Grand slam. He runs around the bases. And his teammates carry him off into the dugout like in the movie. Is that cool? Yohan leaves that game. He is on cloud nine. He knows that there were major league baseball scouts from the United States in the stands watching. And he's walking home and he's thinking about all the medals and all the trophies and he's thinking about his teammates carrying him off the, off the field, but he's got this little thing that's kind of bugging him. He's this promise that he made he's going to go to church. I don't want to go to church. He gets home and he tells his mom about it and his mom puts his hands on her shoulders and she says, Yohan, I always knew you would pull our, our family out of poverty. So I'll tell you a little bit about this young man. So Yuan was born into a very poor family in one of the poorest parts of a very poor country in Venezuela. And his family was so poor that he and his siblings would each get an arepa, which is like a little tortilla, and a sardine as their food for the day. And, and as Yuan was growing up, he, he was bigger than all the other kids, and he just kept growing taller and taller, and, and he was talented, and so his, his parents put him in baseball, which is the favorite sport of Venezuela, it put him into baseball as a little kid, and man, he was just doing really, really well. And as he gets older, he starts playing on leagues with older kids. If you could show that first picture. So this is, see the arrow pointing to Yuan. He's eight years old on a ten-year-old team. He's just a big, strong, athletic kid. So he's playing, he's doing really well, and all of a sudden he's on a city league, and then all of a sudden he's on a state league, and then by the time he's 16 years old, he's playing in the major league for Venezuelan baseball. In his second year, they have this awesome season, and, and they're just winning all their games, and they get all the way up to the semifinals, and well, you know, the, you know the result of that game. 
So Yuan goes to bed, he gets up the next day, he's super excited about the future, but he's got this little thing inside of him that he promised God he'd go to church. He just told himself, listen, I can, I can, I can handle this, it'll go away, I'm just going to ignore it. He gets up the next day, it's still there. A week later, it's still there. Two weeks later, he can't stand it. He says, fine, out loud, fine, I'll go to church. It's Thursday. He walks out of his house and he starts walking around the block trying to find a church. And he finds a little Nazarene church about three blocks from his house. And he looks up on the wall. It's Thursday night. We have a service at 6 p.m. It's 5 p.m. Dang. <laughs> so he walks into church and he sits down. He's the only one there. After a little while, a, a man comes in and, and sits down next to him. He's the pastor of the church and they start to talk and, and they just really strike up a conversation. And two hours later, the pastor looks at his watch and says, My goodness. Usually we have 25 or 30 people come to church on Thursday evening service. I think God just wanted the two of us to talk today. They keep talking, and by the end of that conversation, that pastor had talked with this young man, Yohan Kamakado, about his whole life, about who God is, and he brought him to a point to where Yohan wanted to bring Jesus into his life. So he prays the prayer, and he accepts Jesus as a Savior. And he walks out of that church a little bit confused, like, what just happened, and, and he's extremely intrigued, and he's excited, and he's wanting to talk about this thing with his family, and, and, and he goes home, and, and he's just really excited, and he gets a phone call, and it's, it's this pastor, this, the next day, the next day, this, this pastor calls him, and he says, hey, Yohan, I, I, there's, a, there's a youth camp, I didn't want to say anything to you until I could verify, but there's a youth camp this weekend, and I got you a spot, it's way past the deadline, but I got you a spot if you're willing to go. And Yuan is hearing this, and he wants to go because he's intrigued by who this God is and who Jesus is, and, and he's just brought him into his life. But he's also afraid. And he says, you know what? First of all, I can't afford it. Number two, I have baseball practice this weekend. There's no way I can go. And the pastor said, I thought that's what you would say, so I, I've put together some money, and I'm going to pay your way. Yuan, please go. So he asks for permission to skip practice, and he goes to this youth camp. And, and he arrives at this place, and the first thing that is just blows his mind is there were 800 other teenagers from all over the country of Venezuela that loved Jesus, that came to this place to hear his word and to worship him. He didn't think that there were that many people that had gone through something similar to him. And so now he's really intrigued, like, what is this? There's something going on. And he sits down, you know, I don't know if you guys have been to camp or a conference, and there's speakers, so there's just one speaker after another coming up, and, and they begin to preach, and... And, and he's listening to all this, and after about three or four, he, he starts to ask himself, when are these preachers going to start talking to the other 799 people that are here? God was penetrating him with his word and his promise. And, and as a baby new Christian, he was absorbing all this into him, into his soul. I want you guys to try to put yourselves in his shoes. How long ago was it when you were going through this kind of an experience, when you came into the realization of who Jesus Christ was and what He wanted with your life and what He wanted with you. Do you remember that time? I, I know I remember at my time when, when I was coming into a realization of who Jesus was and who I was in Him. And it was a powerful time and, and I was reading Scripture in a new way and words were coming off the page fresh and new and powerful. Do you remember that? Do you remember what that was like? Maybe you're a new believer and that was a couple of months ago, or maybe you've been in the church all your life. But just try to put yourself in His shoes. Try to, try to go back to that time in your life and, and relive this experience with Him. The second day came, and He just was falling in love with Jesus. And at the end of the second day, the, a, a man gets up onto the podium. He's a Venezuelan guy. And he introduces himself and he says, I'm a missionary and I serve overseas. And something about that totally rocked Yohan's world. Yohan was like, what? A Venezuelan man is a missionary outside of this country preaching the word? And, and just something powerful about that really connected with Yohan. And we don't know exactly what that missionary preacher of Venezuelan man preached, but we do know that he preached out of Acts chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to go to Acts chapter 9. You'll recognize this passage that it's the, it's the conversion of Saul, the guy that came, became Paul, that wrote the majority of the New Testament. 
And again, we don't know exactly what was said, but I want you to try to put yourselves in Yuan's shoes, 17 years old, brand new Christian, just soaking everything up. And, and we start with uh, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 1, where it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Okay, so coming back to today, we, we read this passage. He was breathing out murderous threats against the disciples. So this is the ancient version of ISIS, right? Because ISIS is out there. They want to cut the heads off of Christian people. And here, this is Saul who wants to kill Christians. He wants to throw them in prison. He wants to do everything he can to stop the movement of Jesus Christ. But Yohan, he is reading this and he's saying, wait a minute, this is not a bad guy. He's just doing what his culture expects of him. We probably can assume that his parents think that what he's doing is a good thing, putting those nasty Christians in prison. And we can imagine that, that his culture expects that. His, his Jewish culture, his Israelite culture expects him to do this. We know that his pastor tells him to do this. We know his priest tells him to do this. The priests give him permission. And so Yuan, he's sitting here reading this and he's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that maybe what culture wants of me is not what God wants of me? And he starts to think about baseball. And he remembers his mom putting her hands on his shoulder saying, I knew you'd pull us out of poverty. And he's just feeling all these things coming from his family and from his, and from his culture showing him this is what you are, this is who you are. And he's beginning to wonder, is there something else that God has for me? Is there anybody in this room that might be feeling the pressure of your culture? That might be feeling the pressure of what your parents expect of you or some other family member or somebody at work that might be pushing you away from what God wants of you? Verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, this is Saul again, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, how many times have we read this passage? And we read it and we say, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven fell to and, and we skip over this. And what we have to realize is that the great I Am, the, the, the Lord of the universe, the creator of everything that is here, intervened in the path of Saul. And the only way he could respond is he fell to the ground. Because he just came into contact with the creator of the universe. And if we can put ourselves back in the shoes of Yohan, he is reading this stuff and he is coming into contact with Jesus Christ. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And again, let's just think back. Saul thinks that he is obeying God. He thinks that he's doing what God wants him to do. And here God is speaking to him through his son Jesus and he's saying, why do you persecute me? And Saul has to respond. He doesn't say, who are you, Lord? He says, who are you, Lord? Because he's just come into contact with something supernatural. Are, are, you, are you with me? And Yuan is sitting here, he's reading this, and he's like, who are you, Lord? And, and Saul asks. And then Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In verse 6, he says, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 17-year-old star stud of the team, Yohan Kamakado, reads the word, you must get up and I will tell you what you must do. And he's like, uh-uh, I'm the captain of the team. I tell them what to do. And he gets afraid. How many of us in American culture really like that slogan, your way right away, which is my way right away? How many of us in American culture say, I am the master of my domain? I'm in charge of my destiny. That is a very American way to think. But how many times do you think, folks, how many times, church, has God spoken to us in our individualism, in our pride, in our desires to do that and that instead of that have caused us to not listen to what God is asking us to do? Do you remember a time in your life, in your path, in your walk with Jesus Christ where He asked you to do something and you found a way to ignore it or to not follow it. 
And here you want is in this seat, and he's really feeling the pressure. He's like, no, I don't get told what to do. I tell people what to do. I'm the star of the show, and he's used to getting what he wants done. And he's just squirming, and he's just beginning to realize, God is, God is telling me what I must do. What is going on? And he's getting afraid because he feels like baseball is slipping out of his fingers, and God is going to try to get him to do something. It's interesting that, that, that God intervenes in, in, in Saul's path. And, and, and we see Saul here on the ground, right? He's on his knees and he's blind. And Jesus just kind of leaves him there for a minute and he goes and begins to speak to Ananias. It, it, guys, we've got to realize this is all supernatural, mind-blowing stuff. God spoke to him through a light or something. I don't really get it. And then he goes and he speaks. Jesus is in heaven, okay? And Jesus speaks to Ananias, this guy Ananias. And Ananias is a believer, Right? And Jesus begins to speak to Ananias and says, Hey, Ananias, I've got an idea. Uh, there's this guy named Saul of Tarsus, and Ananias is like, Yeah, I know who that guy is. He's trying to kill us. And Jesus says, And I want you to go to him, and you're, you're, you're the messenger that's going to talk to him to tell him some things that he's supposed to do. And Ananias is like, What? That's dangerous, God. Why would you put me in harm's way? He sounds like some believers I know. What? No, that's dangerous. No, that's expensive. No, that's not a good idea. And it makes me wonder how many times in my life has God asked me to do things and I found an excuse not to do it, whether it was dangerous, it was scary, or it was unknown, or it was uncomfortable, or it was expensive. Or... Imagine if Ananias had not obeyed what God was telling him to do. We might not have half of the New Testament written by Paul. It's amazing how God has the power to speak to Paul directly, but he chooses to activate his believers, to activate his disciples, to make things happen. That ought to blow some minds in here. Let's jump down to verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument. And Yohan is sitting there in his seat, and he hears these words, chosen instrument. And he's like, what? Are you talking to me? I want everybody in this room to know you are God's chosen instrument. I don't know for what. God knows for what. You might know for what. But every person walking on this earth was designed by God for service to Him. Everyone. The guy that's passed out drunk from getting drunk last night, he was chosen by God to do something for His kingdom. Everybody in this room was chosen by God to do something for His kingdom. And Yohan is listening to this, Go, this is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And in this moment, Yohan begins to see baseball slipping out of his control. You're going to make me suffer? Why would you make me do that? This missionary preacher finishes up his message and he does an altar call. And he invites these 800 young adults, these teenagers, to come forward and accept a call into full-time ministry for Jesus Christ. You know, they do this in camp. You know, they, 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 they do this. The Holy Spirit moves and, and the pastor feels inspired and they invite these kids. The same thing's happening here. And, and I don't know if you remember when you, when you really gave your life over to Christ, but Yohan is sitting here and he's, he's weeping like a child. And he totally feels the power of Jesus Christ. Not, not in a light, but kind of like that light. He just feels like he's having an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he is so moved. And he's scared to death. And he doesn't know what's going to happen. But he gets up almost like out of his own physical control. And he gets up and he walks down and he's crying on the altar. And he accepts a call that he feels to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. Let's jump one more verse down to verse 20. Chapter 9, verse 20. It says, At once he began to preach in a synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, now, again, let's go back. The first verse in this passage was he was breathing out murderous threats against the people of Jesus Christ. And verse 20, it says, At once he began to preach in a synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. So why are we surprised that Yohan, having an encounter with Almighty God, has come to this conclusion so quickly. Yesterday he was a baseball stud. Today he's going to be a missionary. What? 
Because that's how powerful Jesus is. And if we would allow Him to come into our lives and we begin to forget about all the junk that's cluttering our minds and blocking us from the plan that God has for His chosen instruments, it might make a little bit more sense. So you want to get some with camp and he is just like, he's a mess, right, emotionally. He's like, oh my goodness. And, and he's got what we call a camp high. Anybody here ever go to camp? Raise your hand if you ever went to camp. Okay, you guys know what a camp high is, right? You, you go home from camp and you're like, I'm going to tell all my friends about Jesus. I'm going to tell my brother who hits me all the time about Jesus. I'm still going to hit him, but, but I'm going to tell him about Jesus. Uh, I'm going to tell my dad to stop doing this and my mom to stop doing that and I'm going to start doing this and I am on fire for Jesus. And Joanna is going home and he's practicing his speech for his mom. And he walks in the door and he says, Mom, Mom, i got to tell you something. And she says, No, no, me first. And she's got a big smile on her face and she hands him a letter. It's from the Atlanta Braves baseball team. It's an invitation to go talk to the scout. And Joanna is looking at this and he is more confused than he's ever been before in his life. And he's looking at this and he doesn't have the courage to tell his mom what he'd been practicing to tell her. And the next day they go and sit down with the scout and he slides a contract across the table and offers him $700,000 a year to play baseball for the Atlanta Braves. And his mom looks at him, she puts her hands on his shoulders and says, I always knew you'd pull us out of poverty. And you want his crutch. He doesn't know what to say. He goes home with his mom. He gets a phone call. It's his pastor from his church, and he picks up the phone, and his pastor says, Yuan, I got some good news. He goes, now what? He says, Yuan, I talked to the seminary in Quito, Ecuador. I got you a scholarship to go study the Bible for free. It's worth $700. He's a 17-year-old kid. Muscular, athletic, tall, talented, He's got a bright future and he's staring at a $700,000 a year contract and a $700 scholarship to study the Bible. I wouldn't be telling you this story if he chose baseball. Yohan accepted the offer and he moved to Ecuador because he's a missionary, right? Studies the Bible for a few years, plants a couple of churches, and then I happened to meet him and we were planting a church in a city called Ibarra, Ecuador, and uh, interviewing him to be a pastor. I, I just thought he was a pastor. I didn't know he was a baseball player. and kind of tall for a pastor, but hey, okay, whatever. And, and we're talking, and, and, and we hired him to plant a church. And if I could show you this, the next picture. So this is a picture of his church plant team, and this is an opportunity for me to kind of tell you what it is that we do. Um, so Yohan is in the sunglasses here, kind of third from the left. And that's his wife to his left, and they have a little, had a little boy uh, uh, at that time. Oh, he's not in the picture, though. Um, and so this team arrived in 2014. This was our 82nd church plant. We planted 95. This was our 82nd church plant. And so we built a team around Yuan. So we sent him five North American 4040 missionaries, and we sent him five South American 4040 missionaries from Ecuador. And we partnered those, those people together. So each male North American with a male South American female with a female, and they, they work in partnership uh, together under the leadership of their pastor. And so this team of people had the job to go into the city of Ibarra, there's no church there, and their job is to put a church there. And they have two years. And so their strategy is pretty simple. We're just going to go into the community, we're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're going to love people unconditionally, and we're going to see what God's going to do. And after, a, after one year, the church had grown to 140 people. If you can go to the next picture... So this is a picture of a Sunday where they were doing baptisms uh, out on the property that we bought for, for that church. And, and the church grew to 140 people. It's bigger than that now. It continues to grow. And, and that is the fruit of Yohan's ministry and our young adult ministry. Anybody here between the ages of 18 and 30? Raise your hand. You folks. That's our strategy. Anybody ever told you you guys have, have what it takes to plant a church? I'm telling you right now, you have what it takes to plant a church. And so they work hard for, for two years. In that crowd, there is one young lady. Her name is, is Liz. And I want to tell you her story real quickly. I wish I could tell you the story of every single one of those people because every single one of those 140 people have a story. But I want to tell you about Liz. Liz was born in, into a family that was what appeared to be normal. But when she was seven years old, she walked into her parents' bedroom and found that her father had committed suicide. And nobody talked to that little girl. 
Nobody explained to her what was going on. Nobody helped her through a grieving process. And so there was this pit in her heart that her father left, and there was this doubt in her mind that maybe it was somehow her fault. And she grew up with that, and she grew up trying to compensate for that and trying to dull in the pain and, and, and get past, get through the day. And when she was 13 years old, she started to drink excessively. When she was 14, she started to do drugs. When she was 15, she started to lead a really promiscuous lifestyle. When she was 16 years old, she was hanging out with some friends, and one of her girlfriends came up to her and said, Hey, Liz, I know what you're capable of. Did you know that you could make money at it? And she introduced her into the world of prostitution. And every day for two years, six days a week, eight hours a day, she worked as a prostitute. And as she continued in this profession, she fell further and further into this pit of despair. And she came to the point to where she told herself, you deserve this because you have no worth, you have no value. If you can imagine how dark of a life this is and how empty and how painful a life this is and she still is missing her father and blaming herself and all this stuff that's going on. And one day her mom was in a park and she met some of our 4040 missionaries. And they came up to her and they start, struck up a conversation. They invited her to come to a small group, a Bible study. And so the, the mom, Liz's mom, went to a Bible study and, and God got a hold of her and she gave her life to Christ and she began to grow in her relationship with Jesus. And she's desperate for her daughter Liz. She doesn't know really what's going on, but she knows it's not good. And she's praying for her daughter and she's inviting her daughter to come to church. And Liz is like, I am never going to church. And she just put all these excuses up. But the truth was, she didn't think she was worthy of going to church. God can't forgive what I have done. And her mom keeps working on her and keeps inviting her. And, and finally, we have these, uh, our, our, our missionaries put on uh, what's called an encounter with Christ. It's a two-day spiritual retreat that we ask all new believers to go to. Liz isn't even a believer, but they invite her to come to this encounter, this encounter with Jesus. And she goes, and God radically touches her heart. And she walks out of there a believer in Jesus Christ, but she's still got one foot in prostitution. That's how she makes her living. But she's got one foot in the church and she feels guilt and shame and it's just a real big mess. But slowly but surely, God begins to heal her heart and she begins to accept that it wasn't her fault that her dad died. And she begins to accept that she actually has value, that the church is her family and they love her and God loves her unconditionally and He can forgive her no matter what she has done. There's nothing she can do to increase or decrease God's love for her. Did you hear that? There's nothing any of us can do to increase or decrease how much God loves us. It's unconditional and complete. And she fully embraces this and she gives, she gives up the life of prostitution and she begins to follow Christ. A year passes and she decides to get baptized. I had the blessing of being able to go into her, to the service where she got baptized. And I knew her story and I'm sitting in the crowd and and I just watched her get baptized, and it was the most amazing thing. And, and somebody actually recorded uh, her baptism. It, we've got that video, if it's going to work. If you could throw it up on the screen. So this is the moment she's being baptized. That's Liz, just half of your line. We baptized 12 people that day. Just look at the emotion on her face. That's just walking over to the pastor's wife. Just take note that our baptismal church has whales and flowers on the side. So I walked up to Liz after she's soaking wet and I give her a big hug. No, I'm soaking wet. And I said, Liz, I'm so proud of you. But I got, I've got one question. Why did you wait a year? We've had like three baptism Sundays since then. Why did you wait a year to get baptized? And she says, well, I, I had something that I had to do before I was ready to take this step. I had to go back to that girl that invited me into prostitution. And I had to forgive her. It was the last thing I was holding on to. And so a couple of weeks ago, knowing that this Sunday was coming up, I called her and I went down to Quito, which was about two hours away, and I sat her down, I bought her a cup of coffee, and she was embarrassed and she didn't know what to say, and, and I just told her I loved her. And I told her that God loved her. And I told her I forgive you. 
And God wants to forgive. And she basically preached the gospel to this other prostitute. And by the time they got done with that coffee, this other girl prayed the prayer to accept Jesus into her heart. And she hasn't gone back to prostitution since, praise the Lord. She's now going to a small group with other young ladies who are struggling with sexual purity. If Elizabeth's telling me this, I, I, I'm like, I can't control it, I'm starting to cry, and I'm just so proud of her, and she's starting to cry, and we're just standing there crying. And Yuan comes up to me, he goes, this is baptism Sunday, not a funeral. Why is everybody crying? And I told him the story, and he starts to tear up. So these three, the three of us are here, we're, we're crying. Remember, we, we didn't have our building yet, so we preached under a tent with a dirt floor, and we did a baptism in a kiddie pool with whales on the side. And I looked up to Yuan, and I said, do you ever regret not choosing baseball? It was a rhetorical question. He says, you know, that day when I was faced with that decision and I got the pressure from my family and, but I know God called me to be a missionary, I pulled out my Bible. And he said, I didn't really know the Bible. I'd only been a Christian for a few weeks. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to turn. So I just randomly opened up the Bible and I stabbed my finger and guess what it landed on? Matthew 6.33 Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all the rest will be given to you as well. And I said, but Yohan, haven't you ever heard of Tim Tebow? And he said, Brian, God called me to be a missionary. He told me to seek first the kingdom. And he goes, you know what? Third floor, tent, kiddie pool. I'm the richest man alive. Ladies and gentlemen, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And I'm going to modify that second part of that phrase. Because nothing else really matters anyway. I don't know where you're at. I don't know how long you've been a Christian. I don't know what God expects of you. But I hope that the story of Yohan's life inspires you to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will work itself out. God bless. Thanks for joining us today. You can find Eustick Road Church of the Nazarene on the web at eusticknaz.org and on many social media sites at Eustick Naz. Thanks and God bless.